Hi, all my physical science peeps. Welcome to home learning for this week. I do want to let you know that we have a different schedule this week. Hopefully you didn't come to school yesterday, um, but do know that you have school on Friday. You guys are kind of used to having that be an assessment day where not as many teachers assign you to actually check in with them, but we've shifted the four-day schedule to Friday, so please make sure if you're in one of my class periods on Friday, you're still checking in for attendance and don't lose track of what day it is. A little bit of updates. I've kind of been trying to keep you on track with our FET project. This is kind of a self-guided project that you're working through for the rest of the semester as a lab grade. You should have already completed all of the FETs in green. We're now in the fourth week of home learning, which means I have two new sets of FETs for you to work on. One of them is balancing equations. I'm actually going to be teaching a lesson on balancing equations in the second half of this week. I'm going to give you time and actually walk you through that FET in class. Um, so you can work on, you know, know that one's coming in class, but the second one, reactants, products, and leftovers, you're going to need to work on that on your own time this week outside of class, um, just knowing that you're contributing towards your FET project, which is due May 15th. I want to go over the self quiz that you guys took last week and over some of the information we learned. So we talked about covalent ionic bonds and an anion and cation. You should at now be very certain of the definition that in covalent bonds, electrons are shared, ionic bonds, electrons are given away. An anion being negatively charged and a cation being positively charged for an ion. And then you had the rest of the quiz where we're starting to looking at your periodic trending, be able to identify different um, atomic radiuses versus ionization energies. So you kind of built different charts in your activity last week. You should see that the element that has a larger atomic radius means that it's calcium because it's further to the left on the periodic table than bromine. And germanium also has a larger atomic radius being further to the left. The element has a higher ionization energy. Higher ionization energies are in the top right of the periodic table. So argon is further to the top right than sodium. And lithium is further up than rubidium. If you are filling in the blanks here, anions tend to take electrons because they are smaller. The larger the atomic radius, the smaller the ionization energy. And then you have to kind of decide, is when you're bonding two elements, is it ionic or a covalent bond? You can use this by looking at trends on the periodic table. An ionic bond is usually going to be two elements that are on very drastically different sides of the periodic table. They're not very similar in size or ionization energies. Versus covalent bonds, when they share, they're usually the same size. So for oxygen and silicone, it is covalent. You can see oxygen and silicone are in the same group. They're very similar in size. Versus potassium and fluorine, very opposite sides of the periodic table, gives us an ionic bond. And we're going to use that information in our lesson today. Then I gave you this question. I asked you which one of these is ionic and which is covalent. Water is an example of a covalent bond where you can actively see electrons being shared in the diagram versus salt. Chlorine, which has a higher ionization energy, steals an electron away from sodium to create an ionic bond. Then you did a periodic trending activity where you built these graphs and you also built a model of atomic size. Here's kind of some general overview of some answers you should have gotten from that activity. Everyone should have their own individual grade, and you can check Schoology for any comments that I gave you. But here's the general trends that you need to be aware of. For atomic radius, it increases down into the left on the periodic table. This is, um, it's increasing more so on the left side of the table, and it's less big on the right side of the table because as you're moving from left to right, you're increasing the number of protons. The more protons you have, we learned about this when we talked about forces, but you increase the strong nuclear force. 
And that's the force, remember, even though protons and electrons don't like each other, the stronger that force is, the tighter in it pulls the electrons from the outermost ring. So the atom is more tight-knit together, therefore it is smaller. For ionization energy, it increases up and to the right, and it helps us predict any sort of bonding relationships. Um, when you have the same type of energy, that means you have a covalent bond. If one atom is requiring more energy than another, it's going to steal and take away those electrons, and you're going to have an ionic bond being formed. And one of the answers at the bottom there, it is true that the smaller the atom, the harder it is to pull its valence electrons away. So that should be a review of that activity. If you have any further questions on that, please let me know because we're going to utilize this information as we move through more activities. So for today, the materials that you need to take out, you have this number five naming note taker in your at-home packet. This is, we're going to work through the front side of this today. And the back side is an activity that you're going to work through on Schoology that you need to complete by the end of the day um, or the end of this week. And it's going to be 15 points in your home learning category. So our objective today is we're going to learn how do you name compounds. We're starting to look at how bonds are formed. Well, a bond is formed and then you have a compound, which is more than one atom that's put together. How do we name them? So we're going to go through some shortcuts. I have a flow chart for you, and you're going to work on a naming activity where you practice naming different types of compounds. We're going to start off with some quick shortcuts, some background information that you need to know. So first off, when you're bonding two different atoms, and the end of the name ends in ein, once you've created a bond, you're going to turn the new ending into eid. So for example, when you have chlorine, it turns to chloride once you've bonded it. So when you're talking about bonding sodium and chlorine together to create salt, that compound is actually called sodium chloride. And there's an exception to that, which is unless it is polyatomic. Now we have different types of bonds that we're looking at. We know an ionic bond you have different sized elements, they have different ionic energies, and it's usually a combination of a cation and anion together. When you're creating a covalent bond, those atoms have similar sizes, similar ionization energies, and it's an anion and anion, versus when you're creating a metal, you're putting a cation and a cation together. Knowing the difference between what type of bond it's making is helpful in determining a shortcut when I'm going to walk you through a flow chart here in a second of how do you determine the difference of what to name these different properties. So let's take Cl2 for example. We're going to talk about subscripts here for a second. That 2 is called a subscript. All that's telling me is that I have two chlorines together. Same thing here when I have SO4 parentheses with a subscript 3. The first subscript of the four tells me that there's four oxygens bonded to that one sulfur. And then within a parentheses with another subscript on the outside of it tells me that I have three of those compounds. So it looks like this. I have three SO4 compounds. These also contribute to something called a polyatomic ion. So we know... We, the word ion, it means something has a charge, but a polyatomic ion is something that's made up of more than one element. SO4 negative is an example. On your note sheet right here, I have given you a list of polyatomic ions. I will never expect you to memorize these, but you do need to keep them handy as I continue to explain how to name them this chart is going to become very valuable. So do make sure that you have this information written down on your note taker before I flip to the next slide. So here's this chart that you're going to have. I really want to emphasize that that word poly means more and atomic. So you're actually splitting this down. It's two or more atoms versus ion has an overall charge. So please keep this chart nice and handy. We're going to start talking 
about some Greek names. This, these naming systems have been going on for a long time since the Greeks. And we're going to use specific prefixes to qualify how many, I guess I should say quantify, a little scientific mistake there, Miss Ducey, quantify how many of an atom we have. And to do that, we use a Greek prefix. So if I have one of an atom, I say mono. For two, I say di. Three, tri. Four, tetra. Five, penta. Six, hexa. Seven, hepta. And eight, octa. These should look really familiar. We use these in geometry, when, usually when we're naming how many sides of a shape there is. We also see things like octopus, and something that has eight legs, tetrahedral. Lots of these Greek prefixes are used in a lot of different settings, as well as naming chemical compounds. So I'm going to introduce to you an actually really scary chemical compound, but it's all introduced in the terms of what its name is. So dun dun dun. Dihydrogen monoxide is a chemical which is colorless, odorless, and kills uncounted thousands of people each year. Most deaths are caused by the accidental inhalation of dihydrogen monoxide, but the danger does not end there. Thousands of American companies dump millions of gallons of dihydrogen monoxide into our lakes, streams, and oceans each year. Nothing can be done because this practice is still legal. Dihydrogen monoxide is used as an industrial solvent and coolant used in the manufacture of styrofoam, fire retardant, and pesticides, as well as in the nuclear power industry. Symptoms of dihydrogen monoxide ingestion include sweating, uh, vomiting, body electrolyte imbalance as well. Last year, 3,482 people died as a result of dihydrogen monoxide ingestion. If we don't act now, thousands more will die. Hmm. Watching that video made me really thirsty. I really love me some dihydrogen monoxide. Should we ban dihydrogen monoxide? Do you think we should ban dihydrogen monoxide? Do you think we should ban this chemical? It's and all you're asking if we want it to be banned? Dihydrogen monoxide. Should we ban dihydrogen monoxide? Do you think we should ban the chemical dihydrogen monoxide? Uh, I don't know what that is, but yeah, sure. What? Yeah. What's that? What does that even do? <laughs> you don't know dihydrogen monoxide? <laughs> no. What's that? I can tell you the effects of it in its gas state. It can burn people. It can, um, in its liquid state, it can burn people. It's like a, it's a large component inside oh, people's tumors. So in acid rain, it's in tumors. Yeah, I don't, I don't like that in America. All right, I, I don't want it in my country. It's water. Oh, it's water? Dihydrogen, H2O. Oh! Di no. Hydrogen monoxide? No. no, yes. Yeah? No. You should ban right. I'm not sure. It's water. But okay. dihydrogen don't, monoxide. Don't ban it then. All right. I, if it hurts people, then yeah. Do you know what dihydrogen monoxide is? No, you just told me. It's water. Water as a gas hurts. No one? Oh, I guess it could. Yeah. Rain. Ban it from school? Yeah, ban it from school. We have it at school? We do have it at school. <laughs> oh, yeah, then we should definitely we ban should it. Ban I don't it. want to die. Do you know what dihydrogen monoxide is? Yeah, you said it burns people. It's water. In its gas state, water can burn people. It's in acid rain because it's water. Why are you trying to trick me now? Do you, know, do you still know what this is? Yeah, I think so. Do you do? Can you tell me? Um. <laughs> it's, it, it's water. <laughs> Do you know yeah. what dihydrogen monoxide is? No. It's water. H2O. Don't put that in there. H2O? No. Why not? Is it, isn't that water? Yes. <laughs> ding, ding, ding. We have a winner. Yeah. So I know you're smarter than all of those people that were just in that video, and you know that you can use these awesome naming rules to identify chemicals in compounds. So don't ever be fooled again if someone tries to use a fancy dihydrogen monoxide on you.
Maybe you'll try it on your parents later. Hey, no sleeping in class. Unlike my cat, I know that you're definitely following along with your note taker. So we've already completed the prefixes. And at this point, you should be looking at these flow charts that we're about to go through on the front side of that naming note taker. So first, we're going to start with how do you go from the formula to the name of a compound. So the first, this is the flow chart of your thought thinking process. This is the first thing that you should think about. Is the formula I'm looking at covalent? If it is, I'm going to name it using Greek prefixes, the ones that we just learned. If it is not covalent, then I have to ask myself a second question. I have to know, does it have a polyatomic ion? Those are the ions that are listed in this chart here. You're going to have to actually check the chart to see if one of the polyatomic ions is listed. If one of them is listed there, then the name is going to be the element plus the polyatomic name of that ion. If it does not have a polyatomic ion, it's going to be the name of the first element plus the name of the second element, except for the ending is going to be changed to "-ide." So let's work through a couple examples. Our first one is sul SF6. That's sulfur with six fluorines. So the first thing I'm going to ask myself is, is it a covalent bond? Well, sulfur is an anion. Fluorine is an anion. So yes, since they are both anions, they're very similar in size, similar in their ionization energies. It is a covalent bond. So then I'm pretty much led to my next direction, which means I'm going to name it using a Greek prefix. But I'm not actually going to use the prefix mono to describe that there is only one sulfur. When you're putting a prefix into a name, just like the word pre, it goes directly before the name of the element. So for sulfur, there's only one of them. I don't need to say monosulfur, just sulfur. And then for the next part, fluoride, with that ending of an element with ide, not fluorine, I'm going to end it in ide. I'm going to use the prefix hexa, which tells me there are six fluorines. So the, my entire compound name is going to be sulfur hexa fluoride. All right, let's look at another example. I have magnesium, I have carbon, and then I have oxygen with a little subscript three, which means I have three oxygens. So first thing I need to know, is it a covalent bond? Well, magnesium is a cation. Carbon can be a cation or an anion, and oxygen is an anion. So knowing that the elements spread across the periodic table, I pretty much automatically know that no, it is not a covalent bond because either carbon or oxygen is going to be stealing electrons away from magnesium. My next question is, does it have a polyatomic ion? Well, I'm going to search on my ion chart. I'm going to look for the, if any of these combinations is listed there on the chart. And it is CO3 is the ion carbonate. And it does have a charge, but I do see that there's a polyatomic ion connected there. So my answer is yes. So in order to name this compound, I'm going to first write the very first element plus the polyatomic name. So Mg is magnesium and CO3 is carbonate. So my name, my element, magnesium, plus the polyatomic name, carbonate, is magnesium carbonate. Okay, let's go on to a third example. I have a K. Now, if you haven't caught on to this yet, it's really strange, but K is actually standing for potassium. And that subscript there tells me that I have two of them. And then the S stands for sulfur. So first is a covalent bond. Well, you have potassium in group one. Sulfur all the way on the right side of the table as an anion. No, it is not a covalent bond. Sulfur with a higher ionization energy is going to steal electrons away from potassium. Is there a polyatomic ion in here? 
Well, if I look on my chart, there isn't really any sort of polyatomic ion that only has one element in it, and I don't see any potassium or sulfur just listed by itself, so no, it is not a polyatomic ion. So in order to name this, I'm going to take the name of the first element plus the second element with an "-ide at the end." I don't have to worry about any Greek prefixes for this. Since it is a covalent bond, I don't need to list how many there are. So I'm just going to say potassium sulfide. I'm not going to say potassium sulfur. I want to change the ending of that element to "-ide to indicate that it is a compound. So potassium sulfide. So that concludes how to go from a formula to a name. Next, we're going to flip that around. Well, what if I give you a name and I want you to write the formula? So this gives us a different flowchart. Does it contain any Greek prefixes? If the answer is yes, then that means it's covalent, and I'm going to use the prefixes to write out the formula. If it doesn't contain any Greek prefixes, I know it's ionic, but I need to know, does it contain a polyatomic ion from my chart? If it does, I'm going to have to look at the oxidation number of the polyatomic compound and the oxidation number of the single element to write the formula. We're going to work through some examples of that. If it doesn't have a polyatomic ion, we're just going to use the oxidation number to write the formula like we've frequently been practicing in class lately. So let's go through some examples. My example is dihydrogen monoxide. Just by looking at that, we should already know what the answer to this formula should be based off the videos that we just watched, but let's actually practice working through this flowchart. So does it contain Greek prefixes? Well, di and mon are Greek prefixes, so yes. So that means we're looking at a covalent bond, and we're going to use those prefixes to write a formula. So di on hydrogen, if you look back on our prefixes, di means two, mono or mon means one, which gives me, in a subscript formed, two hydrogen, one oxygen, H2O, or our lovely friend, water. Another example would be calcium chloride. So the first question I ask myself is, does this contain any Greek prefixes? Nope, I just see element names, but does it contain a polyatomic ion? Instead of searching through the formula column, this time I need to search through the names of the ions, see if I see anything called calcium or chloride. In this instance, I do not, so my answer to this is no. So I'm going to use the oxidation numbers of each of these to write a formula. The oxidation number for calcium is plus 2, and the oxidation number for chlorine is minus 1. In order to have the number of particles and their oxidation numbers equal out to 0, I'm going to need two chlorines to equate with the two positive charges on the calcium that I have. So I'm going to have calcium chloride with, in that little two, should be a smaller subscript. You're always going to want to make your numbers the small subscript. So calcium chloride, CaCl2. My next example, aluminum sulfate. So I'm going to look at this. Does it have any Greek prefixes? No, I don't see any monos or hexas or tetras or anything, so the answer is no. Does it contain a polyatomic ion? Yes. Sulfate, as you can see there, right there in our formulas, SO4 with a 2 minus charge is a polyatomic ion. So I'm going to have to use different instructions to name it. I'm going to use the oxidation number this minus 2 of the polyatomic ion with the oxidation number of the single element to help me write my formula. So aluminum has an oxidation number of plus 3. SO4 has an oxidation number of minus 2. Let's look at how do we figure out how many of each of these we need 
in order to create the compound and write the correct subscripts. So we want to practice how do we use the oxidation number to determine the compound formula. So we have a plus 3 charge for aluminum and a minus 2 charge for the sulfate. We need to figure out how many of each of these atoms do we have. A key component that you need to remember is that we cannot split these in half. We can only have one aluminum with a positive 3 charge. If we're trying to even these out, it's not like we're going to take half an aluminum with a 1.5 charge or something like that. So I'm just going to start kind of a tally to visually represent how this math works. So what I'm going to do, I know I need at least one of each. So I kind of just want to identify the charges that I have. If I have one aluminum, I'm going to have three positive charges. And if I have one sulfate, I'm going to have two negative charges. Now I can clearly see that these aren't equal. I have three and two and I need them to be the same in order for my net charge to be zero. Well, I have less sulfate charges than I have aluminum, so I'm going to add another sulfate. So I'm going to go one, two. Well, now I have a negative four charge on sulfate and a positive three charge on aluminum. Not quite even out yet, but I have more negative than I have positive, so I'm going to try and adding another aluminum. So I have another three positive charges. Now aluminum, with how many I have, I have positive six, but my sulfate only has minus four. So I still have more charges than sul aluminum than sulfate, so I'm going to try adding another sulfate here. Actually looks like that does the trick. When I have two aluminum and three sulfates, my charges equal out. I have six positives and six negatives. This also works in your thinking if you're looking at kind of your multiplication here. I'm going to end up writing this out and saying that my chemical formula, well I have aluminum, my subscript is that I have two of them for sulfate, SO4, I'm going to need, I'm going to put this in parentheses because I'm going to need three of them. Something interesting that you'll notice as a pattern that always frequently happens is I kind of just flip-flopped these numbers. This had a positive 3, so I was going to have 3 of the sulfates versus sulfate had a negative 2, and I needed 2 of the aluminum, a frequent pattern that you will be seeing. That leads us to the activity for today. So if you flip over your notes onto the back side, you'll see this chart. It's your responsibility to kind of solve the puzzle and fill in the blanks using the naming rules that you just learned. This is an assignment that you're going to be turning into Schoology, so I've created a Google Doc just like we've been doing all of our other assignments in class. You're going to want to take a picture of your activity, put it into the Google Doc and send it to me for submission. If you can't get Schoology to work, as per always, please just email me a picture of the activity. And once you're done, and I'm emphasizing this, I'm requiring that you log into Google Meets with me today to check in about today's lesson. I want to check for comprehension, talk with you, make sure you understand this whole naming process because it's essential as we're moving forward in this unit. So once you are done with the activity within your class time, please log into Google Hangouts. I have something I need to tell you about the activity. Um, if you're looking at your periodic table of elements, the one that you frequently use because we colored it in class, you might be missing the last period which you actually need for the grouping. So you actually need to know that barium here is in the bottom of group 2 and it's represented with BA and that you also need to know that in group 14 in the last period here is lead represented by the element symbol PB. I'm going to go through the first two of these with you just to get you started. So if you stuck with the video until now, you get a few free answers. So the first row here tells me that I have N2O5, that's nitrogen and oxygen with little subscripts telling me how many of each that I have. Looking at this, I'm looking back on my flow chart. The first question I need to ask myself, is it covalent? 
So the way I know whether or not it's covalent, I look here on the periodic table. Here's nitrogen, here's oxygen. They're right next to each other. They have similar sizes, similar ionization energies. So I know it's going to be covalent. So for the chemical name, I'm going to use Greek prefixes. In order to do that, there are two nitrogens. So I'm going to use the prefix di nitrogen. And for oxygen, it's gonna, there's five of them, so I'm gonna use the prefix pent, pentaoxide, and it's remember ide because I'm always changing the ending from whatever it was, in this case it was oxygen, I want it to be ide to indicate that I'm now looking at a compound. For the second one, I'm looking at calcium chloride. Are there any Greek prefixes in here? Well, my answer is no, I don't see any of those. Does it contain a polyatomic ion? I don't see any polyatomic ions on my sheet, so I'm just gonna use the oxidation number to write the formula. I have to look it up on my periodic table. I see that calcium has a plus two charge, chlorine has minus two. That math is pretty easy in my head. If I need to equate my total net charge to be zero, I know I'm gonna need two of my chlorines to cancel out with the positive two of the calcium. So I'm going to have calcium chlorine, and that should be a subscript too. Also to fill in this chart, I also need to know, is this ionic or covalent? Well, I need to look here on my periodic table, calcium all the way on the left, chlorine all the way on the right. They're very far apart from each other on the periodic table. Therefore, I'm looking at an ionic compound. So I'm going to conclude this and let you jump into this activity and you're going to need to log on to Google Meets when you have any questions and to check your answers for this. But before you go, I want to give you a little bit of an overview for the rest of the week. So today you're going to turn in, these are your, all of these Schoology assignments you need to do, either on Schoology or email them to me. Today you need to do this naming activity. Uh, the next lesson I see you, you're going to do a balancing equations activity. Do by the end of the week, because this is the end of our unit, you need to complete the bonding test study guide. This is worth 15 points in your home learning category. I'm telling you now, so you have the next couple days to be working on it for homework outside of class. It's the last piece of paper in your bonding home packet. Don't delay till Friday to just work on this. I know some of the questions you might not be able to answer quite yet, but you should be able to work through most of this vocabulary and a, at least a good chunk of the first questions before the end of the week and before we go over our last lesson of this unit. All right, guys, you rock. Have an awesome beginning of your week. I will see you in Google Meets when you log in after you complete the activity.